All right. I think we should be live. Ring crypto and randomness. Okay. And the Wi Fi is working. Excellent. Okay, so today is a little different <laughs> um, for a couple of reasons. It, first, that uh, yes, 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 no backups. Sorry, just one second. Okay, as I was saying, today is a little bit different because I'm in Miami, so the setup is a bit of makeshift uh, setup. And <coughs> because it's going to be a bit more of a proper uh, speed run for two reasons. One, that um, the sets are getting uh, a bit harder and I probably some problems would require an hour of explanation to be explained from scratch. Um, so on the assumption that you can read the challenges as we go, or you can ask questions, seriously ask questions if there's anything that I can explain to make you follow along better. Um, I'm going to actually focus on the coding of the, of the challenges. And uh, secondly, because I'm in Miami, there's a beach outside, and we're gonna finish this so that I can get a couple hours of sun. All right, so set four. Uh, oh, it says that it's easier, which is excellent actually. It means that we can speed run it and uh, much more reasonably. Okay. And good, we'll have a good setup and a whiteboard back for the harder problems. Okay, so we go back to our code. We set the banner. By the way, um, audio okay, video okay, considering that I'm on a weird Wi-Fi and with a mm, cheap microphone. Let's get started. Back to CTR. Encrypt the recovered plain text from this file, the ECB exercise. under CTR with a random key. Now write the code that allows you to seek into the ciphertext. Decrypt and re-encrypt with different plain text. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Okay, 
I don't exactly understand if this is plain text or if I suppose it is, but it is not. I'm a bit confused as to what this text is supposed to be. The ECB exercise? I think I yeah, understand the, the, what it wants us to do, but... So, it's saying that <coughs> We already went into this exercise, so maybe it's one of these. It matches one of these. It starts with CRI. Oh, it's seven. It's the exact same thing as seven. No diff, perfect. Okay. Yep. Okay, good, good, good. So we just look at the challenge seven to figure out how to get the plain text. I suppose it had a key or something. Yep. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> hmm. Okay, what the hell am I allergic in here? So we have this uh, plain text and we are told to make a function that allows us to seek into the ciphertext, decrypt and re-encrypt with different plain text. Okay, the idea, the idea here is that the nonce will not change and we're not re-encrypting the entire thing, so then we can just do the XOR trick to recover the, the key stream and then we, we just decrypt it, because if we have two uh, different plain texts encrypted with the same XOR key, we just XOR them uh, together and we get the, to get the difference. Okay. So as usual, uh, we're gonna make our little oracles. First, an oracle generating function. This one. A new file for set four.
and it exposes a function that we'll call edit. Um, let's see how it's supposed to look like. So the key, we're not going to actually expose it here because it says that imagine that it was exposed, that I mean that an API call that didn't reveal the key. This is not a good start for a... Uh, uh, yes. For a speedrun. Okay, so we got a key. Encrypt message makes uh, an IV and returns it encrypted with CTR. No need to do any kind of padding because this is CTR, so it's stream cipher. And we return it concatenated to the IV, which works. And then we have the edit function. Which will return a byte slice. Okay, split it, get the plain text with the crypt CTR. Then we seek into the plain text and copy at plain text position offset forward. We copy the new text. Go will take our for us of uh, choosing the shortest one. Okay, so we are copying this and then we are returning it re encrypted. With the exact same ID. Which is the, the whole problem here. Okay. And then we write a function that will recover this by just using 
by just getting a ciphertext. and a edit function. As usual, the key never leaves this function and the plain text is never returned, but we're gonna use this uh, oracle to recover the plain text anyway. We could do it also, if we couldn't send uh, zero bytes, but if we can send zero bytes, we can just ask it to re-encrypt zeros in that position, and zero XOR the key stream is nothing else than the key stream, and then we XOR that uh, key stream with the result, and we have our plain text. So let's do it in block uh, in blocks of uh, I don't know, sixteen for no sp sp particularly good reason. So the offset, we're going to start it at 16 because we know that there's 16 bytes of uh, IV. And we're going to stop when the offset is beyond there. And at each iteration, we add 16 to the offset. I don't know. We can make it look less weird in the logs, but if it were an email address, which is like, I don't know, 20 characters long. That's completely arbitrary. Okay, so now we have this. We're going to call the uh, oracle. With our ciphertext. With offset. And with a empty slice of length 20, which are all zeros. We get the new CT, we cut out the pieces of both, both which is going to be, uh, and we XOR, as we said, the new CT from offset to offset plus 20, and the original ciphertext. And then we take that and append it to a result. Uh, and finish by returning the plain text. Nice and easy. Uh, oh yeah, we should say that we can return something. Good, good, good. Now, as usual, we make a file for the tests. Bad day for a runny nose. Uh, okay. And we're going to copy the code of test problem 7 to start. Okay, so here uh, we decode the same message as we did before. We, this time we don't print it out. We obtain the Encrypt message. Nope, this is the wrong file. Yeah, sorry, I'm in a, a public business center. Well, public, the hotel business center. Hmm. We generate the new oracles. 
there is no real reason to have a, an encrypt message function when we could just have returned the byte slice here, really. Which would be the ciphertext. We pass just the ciphertext and this edit API, for example, and that would be a function that does, I don't know, a HTTP call to contact the website and obtain this modified cookie or something. And have a look at how far it got us. Yeah, it's not problem seven, it's now problem 25. Index out of range. At line in encrypt CTR. So in set four nineteen. We're failing at encrypting what? Okay, um, we might have a bug in our CTR function one 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 of yeah, okay. I don't think this works. How did this work before? We are at the debugging stage of how did this ever work? Copying the nonce into the input, encrypting it. Oh, no, 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 okay. So we can add a panic in here to make sure that we're not doing it um, next time. But if the length here is the same as the block size, the nonce has to be shorter. So uh, if the nonce is more or equal to the block size, uh, panic with uh, nonce should bit shorter uh, then block size so that the rest can be counter uh, okay so the ID here we are gonna make it eight bytes eight here oh no no uh, uh, yeah, this is a weird implementation, I guess, the one I made, because usually... Let's see where it's used. Mm. 
Yeah, I was making a shorter nose. Okay. Sure. <coughs> okay. This is not how you would implement a good CTR API. You would probably want the entire nouns to be the first 16 bytes and have some zeros at the end. But anyway, we don't really care. Okay, pass. But let's see the text. It's empty. Okay, interesting. Uh, why is it empty? Why is it empty? Let's put these two lengths, they're both high, just as we expect them to be, but this is returning nothing. So let's try print a thing P here. And it's always empty, and that's it. That's the problem. No, it's not empty. It's always apparently zero bytes. Tools don't show up usually. Yes, okay. It's all zero bytes. Uh, why is it zero bytes? Did I? not think this through. <coughs> oh, is this CTR... Is this doing it in place? No, it's not. Let's see what happens if we make a copy of the ciphertext. I think we used all not in place APIs. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the CTR ones do uh, operate in place, I don't remember. We can actually just go check. No, it's not supposed to. Weird. Okay, let's see what happens if we duplicate this first. Okay, I feel like I must be missing something pretty obvious here. Uh, did I think that this was easier than it is? Uh, oh, wait. Ah, there we go. Now, okay, they were in, in place. So since they were changing it in, in place, new CT ended up being the exact same thing as ciphertext. Um, and so it would uh, just return zeros because if you 
um, XOR something with the same thing, it will just come out that way. It's still full of zeros at the beginning. Why is that? This is some silly bag. Oh, maybe it's the XOR function that operates, that touches the inputs. No, it's not. Okay, what in here is modifying ciphertext? Because something was when we are passing it to edit. Oh, maybe the IV? No, that makes no sense. But this is clearly like 16 bytes, isn't it? No, it's eight. Okay, there's definitely something wrong in our CTR. Because eight is just the length of the... Let's reread this. It's making an input and an output. It's copying the nonce into the into the input, incrementing the input into the output, XORing is and adding it to DST, which is a new slice. And it's modifying input, which though is a new slice. This really shouldn't be modifying anything. <coughs> Aha, found that there's a pen here appends to IV and appending to IV allows it to destroy anything in the same underlying ar array Okay, so that's why we needed this. I'm not sure how it explains this, but let's start by fixing that.
Okay. So this should make it work, maybe even entirely. Nope, it still has that bug. But it should start working without this step. Yeah, it works just as well without that step. Okay. Now, uh, at every round, the first eight bytes of new CT and ciphertext are the same. Why? Because we are not correcting the offset here. To remove the eight, the eight bytes. This is an offset into the cipher text. Instead, it should be an offset into the plain text. That's what we're doing wrong. So if we just return minus eight here, it should work. Play the funky music. Okay, this is done. Next problem. Let's remove this logging line. Twenty six CTR bit flipping. There are people in the world that believe that CTR resists bit flipping attacks of the kind to which CBC mode is uh, susceptible. We implement the CBC flipping exercise from earlier, which is problem sixteen, to use CTR mode uh, instead of CBC mode. Inject an admin through token. Okay, let's go copy the text of sixteen, which was. Uh, the last one of set two. So if you don't remember, here we can generate a cookie uh, by passing uh, an email and then the cookie is encrypted with CTR so we can see inside it. It contains some comment and it's like separated by semicolons, and it has some user data. For example, the email. You can't put semicolons and equals in the email. And then there's a comment after. We change this to be the nonce. We change it to encrypt with CTR. We change it not to pad. No padding, the crit with CTR, and we win if our thing contains admin true. How we did it last time, it was by modifying the previous block of CBC so that the next one would end up uh, XORed. This being CTR, we can just XOR the very same block. So instead of sending two blocks of stars, well let's start, let's still do that. No, actually, let's send only one block of stars. We generate the cookie. We know what the prefix is. So the first part of the out is the 8 of the IV 
plus the length of the prefix. The second part is that plus 16 bytes of message and then the rest. And out2 is going to be XOR string of out2, essentially the exact same code, uh, with the difference that while in CBC Well, in CBC, we were modifying this ciphertext so that the next one would get bit flipped. In CTR, we're modifying this ciphertext so that the very same plain text will get bit flipped. And I think this could this should even be enough. So we copy paste the test. Call it problem 26. And pass. We, we generated an admin cookie that returns true to does it contain admin true, even if we can't see the inside and we couldn't see the key just like we did for CBC, but by bit flipping, by XORing this ciphertext, we XORed the resulting plain text. We knew that this was all stars, so we XORed it with the XOR of all stars and the target, what we wanted it to turn into, and that's what we got. Next. Okay, recover the key from CBC with IV equal key. Take your code from the CBC exercise and modify it so that it repurposes the key for CBC encryption as the IV. Or we can just pass the same for key and IV from our test. Applications sometimes uh, use the key as an IV on the access pieces that both the sender and the receiver have to know the key already and can save some space by using it both as key and, and IV. Don't do that. Uh, an attacker can modify ciphertext in flight and get the receiver to decrypt a value that will reveal the key. Okay. Okay, so the scenario is an application where our capabilities are uh, we can see a message pass by and when the, the message is wrong the application due to a bug or, or anything will raise an exception and return an error that includes the decrypted plain text. For example, if your cookie is invalid it will like uh, print. Oh, this, this, this one. Okay. Then we encrypt a message that is three blocks long. <coughs> and as the attacker. We modify the message, we try to decrypt it, which will raise the exception, as we said, and that exception will tell us the, the plain text.
Okay, let's start by building the oracles for this. Okay, so there's a encrypt message. And there's a decrypt message that returns some error. No IV here because that's the error. So, ah, obviously it doesn't return the IV because it's the key, right? That, that's why they think this implementation thinks it's smart because it saves the space of the IV. There we go. We use the same key as they. And for the crypt message. So if padding is wrong, that right now, let's keep it to what we said. Uh, highest key. I guess we can say that it's This is unlikely to work. This is nice though.
heart and There we go. And otherwise returning. And there's no IV, there's just the key. And now we make recover cbc key equal iv which will take the two functions and return the key okay so let's go back and see how we're doing this so we are encrypting a message and then <coughs> oh nice this is reordering them mm -hmm. So it's putting the first block, a block of zeros, and then again the first block. Let's see what happens if you do that. The first block, a block of zeros, and the first block again. So from this, the, the, this gets decrypted, so you get the decryption of the first block, XOR with zeros. So you get what would get out of here too, because this is the first block, this is the first block, this, we're setting this equal to this. And they both get decrypted to the same thing, but since these are zeros, we get this one unchanged. Instead here, we get the same thing, but XOR with the IV. So here we get first block XOR IV. Here we get first block XOR zero. If we XOR them together, it's first block XOR IV, XOR first block, XOR zero. Zero doesn't matter. The two first blocks cancel each other out and we get the IV. And once we have the IV, we have the key because the IV is the key. So we start by making a message. Of four blocks so that we don't have to worry about padding well, three blo entire blocks, so that the last block is entirely padding, and we encrypt it. Then we extract the first block, and we make Atoy, let's use the padding that we know is right in CT over here. So we just copy 
in at position CT16 a block of zeros. And we copy a position 32, which, which is the start of the third block. We copy the first block. Then we decrypt this message. And we get the error string. We recover the plain text by just doing a strings dot uh, trim prefix. Assuming that percent %s doesn't like mess with the input, but I don't think it will. But we can just make a check if len pt is different from What we expect it to be. <coughs> okay. And now that we have these, we return simply the XOR of the first 16 bytes, which we said are first block XOR IV. And from 32 to 32 plus 16, 48, because that's first block XOR zeros. And this should be the key. And how do we check it's the key? Uh, We'll add is key correct just for testing. Okay, let's test this out. And here we're using an encrypt and decrypt uh, oracle. What's the problem here? We're using an encrypt and decrypt oracle to recover a key, which we shouldn't be able to do. Even if we have a decrypt oracle, maybe. I don't know, it will only decrypt things that start with our username or something like that. We shouldn't be able to, we shouldn't recover the key, of course.
Let's test this out. Unexpected point text length. Well, this is unfortunate. Let's see what, what it is. Zero. Zero is not good. Uh, Oh, the padding is broken because the, we messed with the previous block. So let's up this to four and pass. Done. Moving on to problem 28. Ooh, I forgot to start the donations bot. <laughs> Reminder that I'm very happy when uh, when anyone donates to the internet archive and it shows up on stream. Nope, here. Okay. Oh yeah, this is like a message authentication code where you pretend the secret and just make the SHA-1 of the resulting um, of the resulting string. So we start with the SHA-1 implementation. So we're just going to use the one from the standard library. which I think is in sha1.go and sha1 block generic. Oh, hey, this is my code <laughs> to try to make TLS CBC less terrible but we don't care about that. Hmm. Okay, so we're going to need These functions. 
all the way down to here. We can cut out a bunch of stuff. So we don't care about size and block size, we know those. No need for the helper sum function, checksum will be enough. Size is twenty. And we need the two put uint functions. This get optimized by the compiler into a single giant um, into a single instruction. Only when you write them this way, because this way you are certain that you can do it and it doesn't have to like panic here. And finally, we're missing the block operation, which is going to be in SHA1 block generic. Useful. Is and this okay? So we have a share one implementation. And we make a simple SQL prefix Mac.
we're writing the key and the message to the hash and then returning the checksum. Okay, very simple test. We don't need a random key. To make sure that it still works when checking. And we check that if we change anything in the message. it stops working. And just two for six. Okay, it's working. Now let's break it. Okay, so secret prefix uh, max are trivially breakable. The attack relies on the fact that you can take the output of SHA-1 and use it as a new starting point for SHA-1. Two staking uh, an arbitrary SHA-1 hash and feeding it more data. Since the key precedes the data in secret prefix, any additional data you feed the SHA-1 hash in this fashion will appear to have been hashed with the secret key. To carry out the attack, you'll need to account for the, fact, for the fact that SHA-1 is padded with the bit length of the message. Your forged message will need to include the padding. <laughs> We call this glue padding. The final message you actually forge will be the key, the original message, the glue padding, and the new message.
Okay, so this is a very famous attack. I did it for one of the Breaking Bad Crypto, uh, specifically the one at Hacking the Box Amsterdam. Uh, and so, yeah, uh, the attack relies very quickly on the fact that SHA-1 has an internal state, which is these five UIN32s. <laughs> okay. When you do the checksum, it writes some padding to the... <laughs> because it uh, proceeds the, uh, the pieces in chunks. Each chunk is... 64 bytes. So if you wrote like less than 64 bytes, there's going to be some padding. And also at the end, there's a length in bits of the original message that is written at the end. So, but then when it's time to get the actual checksum, it's just nothing else than the five UIN32s concatenated, as you can see in this code. The digest is nothing else than the H values in the state. So if you take these, the digest and put it back into H values, you can keep hashing. You don't know what went into the hash before, but you can keep uh, adding uh, stuff on top. So even if you don't know the key, you can add data to a message that that key signed because the key was already hashed into that hash and you just keep hashing more data into that same hash. <laughs> So, the first thing we need to be able to do is generate the padding correctly. Because we'll need to add it to our message so that when the real Shawan runs, it will still add that padding even, even if it doesn't want to do it itself to reach the same state as we want, we want it to reach. So we need to understand this code. Okay, so padding. It's one, uh, one bit and then zero bits until 56 bytes modulo 64. Okay. So we can make a function that given a length, it will give us the padding. So instead of right here, we'll want to append it to a result. But actually, let's be lazy. Let's make a buffer. and we'll just use the exact same code as the real padding and just make it right to a buffer. 
and then we return the buffer bytes. So now we have a function to generate the padding. To test this, What can we do to test this? Ooh, I know. Because if this doesn't work, something will not work later on, and it will take us forever to figure it out. So let's make something that, let's take a message. and make a SHA-1 hash of it, and we write to the message, and then we run checksum. Checksum will finish it, and then the digest will be in d.h. We don't actually look inside the checks, look at the checksum. And then we make a new SHA, a different SHA-1, and we try writing manually the padding. In theory, at this point, they should be identical. So S will also have so we assert that an X should be equal to zero at that point because an X is how much of it is buffered so that it will be mixed into the function later. If we did the padding function right, calling checksum or actually writing manually the padding should do the exact same thing, which is what we're hoping because the idea is that then here we could keep writing after writing this padding. But then if we take the h values from this, which just means reconverting the digest back into, a, um, back into h values and put them back into ss, then we have the exact same state as after this write. So we can go from here, back to here, and then keep hashing, and the key will be in there, and we will, even if we will not know what it is. Ah, uh, yes, yes, three, five, four. Pass, okay. So we're, this function works. Okay, so it tells us to generate a secret prefix Mac under a secret key of this string and then forge a variant that ends with admin true. This actually broke the Flickr API, by the way, and the Vimeo one, I think, both. 
both allowed you to do this attack very much in the wild and take over any account just by observing a single request they made. As good as having the key in plain text. So let's make the usual Oracle. with a sign I don't know, let's copy this one can just return the cookie immediately So uh, let's make cookie a byte slice. I don't know why I haven't been doing this earlier. Uh, actually, no, I don't like it. That's why. Because you have to make a tight kneel and ugh. So we prepend our Mac. Okay. Oh, actually, we can just, yeah. Cookie is already defined. So first thing, we check the Mac. Uh, it's 20 bytes.
we check the Mac. And if it's not valid, we return false. And then we return string contains that or strings dot has suffix. Okay, we have our oracles. We make sure that it's not enough to just add the text. We make sure it's not too easy. Okay. And now we make a ex extension attack. <coughs> so we get, we'll take an existing Mac and a message length because it doesn't even really matter what the message is and an extension and we're gonna return a new Mac magic so first thing first also this is gonna be specifically show one first thing first we need to invert this operation. We need to read uint32s. I think there's a thing to do that in binary. Yeah, uint32. Is this little engine or big engine? I think it's little engine. Uh, no. No, this is big engine. The zero is as shifted 24 bits and the three is the lowest. So this is big engine. So we start by recovering the state. So we take a new shell one, 
which what does new shell one do anyway? Equals reset. What does reset do? Nothing useful because we're going to destroy those anyway. So let's just make a share one object. And then we go back from the Mac. So s dot h in which order? 0 is from 0 forward. Okay. Okay. Oh, we should return both. Okay, so we have restored our SHA-1 state. So we write to it. Well, first we add to the message. <coughs> the glue. So once we have the new message, we write the extension. So at this point, new message and shower and our S are aligned because we reproduced the padding that was added by checksum in the original execution. So now we take S and we write the extension. And we write it also to new message. And then we just compute checksum, which we'll have to do manually. Oh boy. Unless we set the right length in here.
All right, this should work. So now we should be able to just make a small function to make show one admin cookie that takes a cookie. Splits it up. Wah, wah, wah. This is an easy attack where you can get something small wrong. Oh, the length here is missing the the length of the key. Oh, interesting. A panic that we set up at two or six for safety. Ah, same here. We're forgetting the length of the other message. Boom! And we are admin. We generated a token signed with Shawan and a key we didn't know that says admin equal true. Someone in chat uh, spotted uh, the MD padding here too. Okay. And this was problem 29. So we're moving on to 30. How many left? Three left. Oh, essentially the exact same thing with MD4 because it was popular, like it was easy to find a solution for MD5. This looks like exactly the same thing.
Okay. I'm not gonna even talk that much over this one because it's literally just bringing over the MD4 code and converting to that. You could make this cleaner by using an interface uh, and making it work for any uh, hash function just by using the length interface. I'm going to try to do that if it's simple enough. Uh, actually, now we have to reach into the internal state, so... No, I'm not going to make it. Yeah, here a lot of code could be reduced to use interfaces, if not all of it. Yeah, all of it could be reduced to use interfaces just by uh, making it, uh, adding a function in the interface that is like set state that takes a digest and just Put it, puts it back into the state. This will be for another day. And the padding, we can keep using the same.
Okay, let's have a look at the function checksum here. It seems to be doing the exact same thing for the length with the only difference that So it's 4u in 32s. And this is little endian, not big endian. Because the first is the first byte, no, the last byte then shifted by 8, then shifted by 16, and then the leftmost uh, ends up being the last byte. Okay. Uh, little endian versus big endian means um, how you order the bytes. Um, we are used to doing uh, big endian in our head. So we would write first the most significant byte, the byte that is most important in the number, the one that is biggest, that ends up like multiplied by the highest number and then smaller and smaller and smaller. Little endian, which is how our CPUs usually work, uh, is inverted. Uh, you can easily find it on Wikipedia, by the way. <laughs> It's not that I don't want to explain it, or I think you should know. I, I had to look it up too, but I don't think I can explain it as well without like writing it down and looking at a um, diagram. It should make it pretty easy. Oh, and yeah. Okay, this should work. Just like that, maybe. I'm sure I made some copy paste error. Please. Wrong S values. So it's filling here. <laughs> 
Wait, is it the MD padding function different? This is why we have these tests, because we would have spent all our time looking at the rest of the copy paste stuff without noticing that this is what it was, what was wrong. Hmm. Okay, so maybe the MD padding function is different in MD4. Oh, wait, is this little Indian too? Yep, motherfucker. Very well then. This time it passed, but then it didn't work. Not admin. What are we doing wrong? Oh, I'm sure that somewhere I'm still, yes, assuming 21 splitting here. Uh, when instead it's 16. Still not admin. Huh. Uh, still splitting it wrong. This is why he, making an interface would have been cleaner. Pass. Okay. We are admin also with MD4. This was not different at all. Whew. Almost done. I get to go to the pool maybe. If I don't do anything particularly stupid. Now, okay, charging laptop. Okay, so this is the um, challenge about early exit. So, I'm not going to actually write a tiny application. I'm just going to abstract it away like we always do with oracles.
So this is an oracle. Uh, That, uh, that takes a message and a signature and checks it under a uh, random key. This is why the HMAC package has an equal function. <laughs> Okay, so we have a simple function that um, checks the signature of something by returning whether or not the signature is equal um, to the one they expect with the key that we don't know. Uh, this is the same as having an API that takes a file or a message and a signature and you know tells us if it worked or not. Now we're going to make this easier because we would have to write, write very low level code by making this equal function egregiously bad. But this is why you use um, hmac.equal. This is this equal is exactly, even if without the artificial delay, how um, bytes.equal or in many languages equal equal are implemented. So this is exactly how it would work uh, for equal equal or bytes dot equal. It would go through the um, the string maybe in chunks, but now let's let's not focus on the wrong things. Uh, and as soon as it found a difference, return false. Now of course each of these checks takes some time. We can make that more evident by adding a fifty millisecond sleep in there. as if this took 50 milliseconds. It takes less, but close enough. So the idea is that we can recover <coughs> uh, 
it from the time inside channel. So what we do is that we time an execution And every time we get one more byte right, it will take 50 more milliseconds. So we can just recover it byte by byte, just like in, you know, uh, Hollywood movies. So we make a for loop. We start with a signature of all zeros. So we start with a signature of all zeros, which it's a shell one. And then in a for loop, we make another for loop of all the possible next key values, which is everything below 256. So someone is asking in chat if this kind of a timing attacks is reliable. Like in the real world, can the thread be put on hold arbitrarily by the CPU? Yes, um, and like there might be network jitter and your own CPU might take a little more time. Uh, 50 milliseconds on the same machine, you can, we can write it simple like that. Uh, in the next uh, challenge, we'll see a bit of how you do it when it's uh, um, less um, clear. But in general, uh, what happens in real-world scenarios is that you take a lot of um, measurements, like hundreds, thousands of measurements, and then you average them out. Jitter will average out, everything will average out. And, even, and that's also why adding random uh, poses doesn't help, because they average out. So we take our baseline
We start from 1 because 0 is already the baseline. I mean, might as well. It shouldn't change. Let's say that if something jumps more than 25 milliseconds from the baseline, we say that we found that. If there's already a zero, we will not see a change because that's what we have the signature with. We could also detect this because um, everything is consistently less than the baseline. But might as well try it this way. And what we get to do here is that we get to show it Hollywood style. A slash r to go back and then the x value of the signature and then only when we're done the slash n for the new line Okay. Any message will do. And let's see it work. Look at that, isn't that beautiful? But also, we're not increasing POS. Uh, 
not really any reason because shouldn't be range of the signature. Yes. So it gets much, much slower because every time it takes 50 milliseconds for each byte. <laughs> now while that runs, we're gonna read the next challenge because I think it's about making it Reduce the sleep in your insecure compare until your previous solution breaks and now break it again. Also because we don't want to spend our entire time here. So let's try with four here and five milliseconds as well. Right. We would know it's not working if like a lot of them were turning to zeros, which is exactly what's happening. So it's already broken. Good. Good, good, good. Okay. So we need a better baseline. to begin with. Now, we can obtain that by uh, averaging out different uh, measurements. So we can make a function that is average time And we get after all, let's do a thing while we write this code. We let the previous one run so that we are sure that it runs correctly. Let's make this take. Uh, uh, configurable pose, this one as well, so that we can reuse them. And this will be the simple function. We also removed adding pause. Oh, no, 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 no. For, we're using a range statement now. Okay, while that runs, we go back to So 
So I want to also keep the max time because that way we can tell immediately if it varies too much and we'll have to think about what to do in that case. Okay. The average is total divided by ten, and if we set delta as a constant here to say four milliseconds So let's see if we can get away with just getting a better um, baseline instead. That zero is not convincing, but maybe. So here the max time minus the average is the uh, is sometimes too high. I wonder if it's often too high or not. Too many zeros. No, that's not right. Okay, so uh, one thing we can do is try to disable this and use the average time function for time it here too. But that's just as low as the order. Uh, 
Hold on. What we could work with instead of averages is minimum times. Because we know that those poses have to happen. So let's try working with minimum times instead. Maybe we can get away with like three simple executions. Nope. Why does that not work at all? And try with a smaller delta. Hmm, interesting. I had expected this to work. Okay, we might have to actually do statistics, this is annoying. This might take forever instead. Also with the noise of the other one that we are executing from time to time, I'm sure we broke it at some point. Okay. Uh, How about we cheat? The only thing is that I don't want to wait long enough for the average. So let's see what happens by making this smaller. Let's say that the signature is just a mere 10 bytes. If it works for the first 10 bytes, it will just keep working. It will just, or at least it would work increasing the number here. It would just take us a bunch of time that we don't want to spend in the business center of the Miami Hotel, you know. So, here, where do we set the average value? No worries.
Okay. Yeah. I have a booth. Um, okay. So, so, so that be, you know? like, yeah. as far as I know, it's you can select your table and then okay. you can open right now. Right. Like <sighs> All right. Ah, awesome. Like that. And here, 10. Okay. Ha. The best run too long. What was that? The fuck is happening? Okay. What I'm trying to avoid doing here is actually um, randomizing What I'm trying to, uh, to do, uh, not do is actually doing statistics on how to um, um, essentially like looking at the distribution and detecting the one that is clearly more uh, takes clearly more time and then estimate you know the p-value of how likely it is that. that it's uh, just a coincidence and go from there. So I'd like to see this one happen before we start the other one. Those seem all pretty low numbers. I'm afraid that this is not going to be the right key.
Uh oh. Damn it. Yeah. So I'm gonna make it log the Spend the signature once when starting. Ah, stupid. Oh, no, 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 okay, it was doing it here. No, okay. I just didn't copy paste it, okay. This is one of those problems that have the problem that every time you want to try a new try a fix and try to try to fix it, you have to wait a long time. Okay, looks like this time it's working. So a question from the chat is how on earth did someone figure out timing attacks for the first time? No! Well, I'll call this a win because, like, they are, it's unreliable, but it could work. Um, so, how did someone figure out timing attacks? Well, I mean, these kind of things can be noticed by by looking at um, looking at the code. It's not like someone was poking the function and noticed it would stick in different times. Um, constant time programming is a whole thing, and like. One knows that uh, a certain operation takes longer. So I guess the answer is it took fantasy and intuition, but just like noticing any other security bug. Uh, 
when you know exactly how something works and at some point you put together that you can make it work in a thing that is not expected. Okay. So let's move on to 32 because if we get 32 right, we would have gotten 31 right as well. So that's just cropping all over the place. Am I using the average one? 32? Yeah. Okay. There you go. As you see, with a high enough average here, all timings, <clears throat> all timings can be adapted. Now, depends on on each operation. So there isn't a right answer, but sometimes a median works better than a mean average. Sometimes removing outliers and then using the mean works better. It's really depending on the case and the distribution. Uh, proper papers that exploit uh, real world. Uh, timing side channels um, show the entire distribution on a graph and then show you what uh, um, show which one they chose that approximates better the um, the correct function so a question from Chad is, how do you mitigate against this? And the answer is that you must do things in constant time. Constant time programming is extremely hard. Um, and it works by uh, doing all operations uh, independently from secret data. So for example, what you do, would do here is that you would um, XOR the two values and then OR uh, for each byte, you XOR the two, um, the two values which if they're equal will return at zero, otherwise not. And then you OR that into a fix, into a um, aggregator byte. And you keep doing that, ORing to the same one, and at the end return, you return whether or not that aggregator is one or zero. The only case in which that aggregator would be zero is if all the OR operations were zeros and they are only zeros if they, all the XORs were between equal bytes, so they're only, it's only zero if the whole thing is um, equal. It's extremely annoying to do. Like, constant time programming in general, it has a lot of maps and there were vulnerabilities that came directly from the fact that it has to use maps instead of, you know, just indexes. Please. Yes. And, um, for example, at the padding oracle in OpenSSL that I wrote about on uh, my blog and the Cloud for blog was entirely due to the fact that the code was written in constant time and so you could like shift the, um, shift the mask so out that it stopped matter, uh, mattering and it's complex. Anyway, the point is constant time programming is hard so the real way to mitigate again against this is to try to minimize the places where you have to do constant time programming. So for example, in OpenSSL, the problem was with the CBC um, cipher suites, uh, which require you to extract the Mac in constant time, and that is extremely easy to, uh, to get wrong. Um, so yeah, the, I guess the answer to the question is, you try to minimize where you are actually using uh, 
constant time programming. Uh, this should be almost done. Uh, we're just staring at it until it reaches the last byte and hope. And no, it keeps uh, getting around the last byte. Well, with a higher number here, it would work, but we are, don't have the time to stay and, and, and see it working. But the higher the number of averaged out samples and, and the better it works. Okay, anyway, the policy is getting a bit busy too, so I'm gonna uh, call it a day for this stream. Because this was the last challenge of the set, and so we should have made it in less than three hours. Okay, well. Thanks everyone, this is the time to ask some questions and to go fill the survey so that I know when I can start, uh, at what times and uh, where are people watching from. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, there's the survey in the description, so also uh, fill in the survey even if you're watching on YouTube. Um, yeah, any questions? If there are any questions, I'm... Oh, what's the latest example of a modern timing uh, attack being successful? So the OpenSSL one wasn't a timing attack. Um, it was uh, caused by the constant time programming required to protect against uh, timing attacks. So there are a lot of uh, recent timing attacks and usually they don't work across the network. For example, uh, against OpenSSL or, or some TCP server, but they work against um, uh, machines in the same box. For example, if you have an EC2 uh, instance and I get an EC2 instance on the same machine, I can run timings attack against that, and there's a lot of cache timings attack that work like that. You may want to look up the um, AES cache. Uh, mm, AES cache timing attacks and based on against table based AES. Okay. Assuming there aren't any other questions. Um, I don't know which one cache bleed uh, is, but I assume that yes, cache attacks are usually timing as timings attack. Gonna let a few seconds pass so that uh, to compensate for the lag, but if there aren't any other questions. Okay, thanks everyone, and I'll see you next week. Uh, set five is much harder, so I'm happy that I'll be back in uh, at Recurse and maybe start even a bit sooner. <laughs>